When it comes to Game Boy Advance games that nobody talks about, Blender Bros is one of the finest examples. It's a platformer that sees you taken on the part of a sort of futuristic dog who just so happens to be capable of saving the universe. This game isn't going to win any awards when it comes to its story, but as with most platformers, that's always secondary, with the gameplay being a much more vital component of the experience. And it's safe to say Blender Bros more than delivers in this department. Much like similar games of this type, the entire adventure is split up into a series of levels for the player to overcome. The best thing about them is that each promotes a serious amount of exploration. This allows you to take many routes to complete a level, and leaves a wide variety for challenges. Now Blender himself possesses a string of abilities that help you towards his goal. You'll use his oversized ears to hover, fly, sense objects and attack. But these aren't the only abilities the player gets to utilise, as a big part of the game involves little creatures known as mini bros which do a whole range of different things, from boosting your attacks to protecting you from incoming blows. The last aspect of the gameplay that I'd like to get into are the minigames. There are only three, and one of them, the free fall where you must dodge spike balls, is absolutely terrible. But the other two, the kart race and the foot race, are pretty solid. By participating in minigames you earn crystals that you can use to buy extra health, so periodically taking part in them is a good idea to stay on top of your game. Unfortunately, as a whole, the game is rather short, and don't get me wrong, there are are plenty of better platformers out there, but Blender Bros deserves a go. If you never got around to it back in the day, now is the perfect time to try it out for yourself. The Game Boy Advance was home to several shooters that helped it excel as one of the most popular handhelds of its time. With the likes of R-Type and Gradius, there were plenty for players to chew on, but one that likely passed many by was Steel Empire. It was first released in 1992 for the Sega Genesis, and eventually found its way to the GBA. As with most shooters, you are given a choice of several ships to jump into, and naturally they have their own advantages and disadvantages, as well as promoting different approaches to the gameplay. One for example has more health but is a bit slower as a result, and another has less health but is faster. All the ships have one thing in common, and that is the weapons that the player can use. You've got standard front and back shots, as well as several explosives that release every time you shoot. You've also got your standard super move, which comes in the form of a large lightning strike, which manages to stop everything on the screen dead in its tracks. It may all sound just like another run-of-the-mill shooter at this point, but what really helps set Steel Empire apart from others is the inclusion of an experience system. It doesn't work in the way you'd think though, instead of being rewarded for taking out enemies, every once in a while you'll see a little circle floating around with the letters EX on it. Picking up two of these brings you to level two, and picking up three takes you to a further level. As you level up, your normal shots gain in power, until they become devastating fireballs to wreak havoc upon your enemies. Now taking into account that this game was originally released in 92, the visuals have held up quite well. Most of the enemies, environments and effects have all been updated from the Genesis version, and everything moves very fluidly. If you're looking for something new to jump into, Steel Empire is well worth your time. The Game Boy Advance was no stranger to impressive RPGs. From the likes of Kingdom Hearts to Riviera, players were spoilt for choice, but as a result, many of us flew well under the radar, and the fact that Magical Vacation itself never found its way outside of Japan didn't help either. The narrative begins when the main character and a group of students go away on a summer vacation. They visit a beach, which seems innocent enough, until they are kidnapped while exploring, and it's up to the main protagonist to find his friends. On the gameplay front, it's your typical RPG fair, with the player exploring a huge range of locations and interacting with a lovable cast of NPCs, but most importantly, getting stuck into the turn-based battling system. This is where the game excels, with each encounter allowing you to command up to six separate party members. You can attack, defend, use an item, run or use magic, but also include something called Sairi, which are little elemental creatures, spirits if you will, that you can find scattered across the land. If you meet their requirements, they'll join you and allow you to utilize their powers that correspond with a character's elemental advantage. There's a total of 16 elements in the game, and each of them are either strong or weak against another, so getting accustomed
determined which character to use at the right time is the key to overcoming everything that the game throws at you. But it doesn't stop there, it's through the use of equipment and special stickers which can be applied to your team, there's even more damage to deal out, which really comes in handy during some of the more challenging moments like the boss fights. Now the visuals in Magical Vacation are just simply beautiful, a lush, vibrant sort of paint aesthetic makes up the world as a whole, and brings life to everything that happens on the screen in a mesmerizing fashion. If you're on the lookout for a new RPG to sink your teeth into, Magical Vacation ticks all of the boxes. Collage Rally is a top-down racing game in the style of Micro Machines and lends much from classics like rock and roll racing to create something new. As with most racing games, you can expect to get stuck into a robust and well thought out career mode where a lot of the core gameplay lies. You start off small and slowly work your way up the ranks by completing races and earning several unlockable parts that affect your performance on the track. This is done by spending the money you earn from each event, with each car in the game having its own unique stats in each of the fields of speed, acceleration and grip. These stats translate well into the actual gameplay, as you can really tell the difference in feel between any of the changes you might make. But Canaz Rally is not only about simply reaching the finish line. To amp up the competitive stakes, weapons also play a major role during play. You're allowed to use two throughout the entire game. First you've got rockets and secondly mines. And even though the game only has two weapons, there is a lot of strategy involved in using them. Visually, Canaz Rally is quite simple at face value, but after some time, it's clear that this area of the game is quite impressive. Various 3D effects are utilised to help bring the chaos of each race to life. Dirt kicks up from your tyres, obstacles fly around the track, and with each and every one of these subtle touches, it culminates in what is perhaps one of the best looking games on the handheld. If you're a racing fan and have exhausted the usual suspects on the console, Canaz Rally is more than capable of keeping you hooked. For anyone who's a fan of the Command and Conquer games, you'll instantly feel right at home with Mech Platoon. It's an RTS that centers around the struggle for three vital resources which several factions are vying to control. In order to secure their stake, hundreds of battles are carried out by each of the group's robot forces, and this is what forms the basis for the gameplay. Everything is split up into a collection of missions, which all have a nice amount of variety, such as escorting supply trucks to defending your own base and attacking the enemies. Obviously, the Game Boy Advance doesn't seem as the best place to enjoy a real-time strategy game, but to its credit, Mech Platoon does a good job by providing big menus and controls that translate to the portability of the device quite well. It's not perfect though, and at points it can feel like the AI has an advantage due to not having to use the handheld's inputs, but it's nothing that makes the game completely unfair. Now unlike Command and Conquer, instead of having to create buildings to gain access to new weapons, in Mech Platoon you have to secure technology, which acts as your path to upgrading your platoon. You see, each robot is made up of three main parts. You've got the arms, body, and legs. However, there are different types of each one. Different combinations of the three allow for several types of robots to be made, and this is where you're going to be spending most of your time. The sheer amount of customization on offer is incredible, and it really enhances the overall replay value. When it comes to graphics, Mech Platoon shines on the Game Boy Advance. The isometric viewpoint allows for the player to navigate the battlefield with ease, and with each unit being easily distinguishable from the last, you'll hardly ever find yourself at a loss as to what is going on. If you're a fan of the real-time strategy genre and just so happen to be rocking a Game Boy Advance, Mech Platoon is a must and will no doubt provide you hours upon hours of entertainment. Tang Tang is a puzzle game that revolves around using one of four creatures known as Tangs to collect shiny gem-like items. Some of these gems are placed very high up in each level, and with the Tangs only having a limited height to their jump, this is where the strategy comes into play. You have to create blocks to form a staircase or walkway so you can reach the top of the screen. Whilst you're doing this though, you have to be mindful of enemies, and you only get three bullets to defend yourself with, so you have to be careful about using them. Each of the levels will see the enemies basically regenerate from the same spot over and over, and they can destroy blocks that you've just set if they bump into them, so timing is a heavy factor in this game, which does make it quite challenging, but at the same time incredibly rewarding. Once you've collected the diamonds, a door will appear and you make your way to the exit, but this can sometimes be just as puzzling as it is to get the diamond itself. There are also bosses, which require a lot more strategy than the normal enemies. Like I mentioned, the normal enemies are quite predictable, but the bosses are anything but. It'll take a few 
few minutes and a few lives to spot their patterns. Now as with most puzzle games, there's a great deal of replay value included, but just not as much as you're led to believe by the back of the box. It's advertised that there's 120 levels in total, but in actuality there's only 30, as depending on which tang you choose to play as, each of the levels and the blocks and backgrounds that comprise it reflect their colour, so it's not an entirely different level, more just a palette swap. But apart from the false advertising, the actual content of the game is extremely enjoyable. Just don't expect it to last that long. If puzzlers are your thing, Tang Tang would make a welcome addition to your collection. From Zelda to Boktai, there was no shortage of quality action RPGs on the Game Boy Advance, but one that never really got its chance in the spotlight is a little game known as Seema the Enemy. The player takes on the part of Ark, a rather juvenile individual who's tasked with taking on the Seema, an alien race who just so happened to feed upon human hope. Now the most important part of any game is gameplay, and Seema does a solid job. It's a mix of action, puzzle, and a little RPG sprinkled in. When you control Ark, the fighting and action is much like you'd find in the Legend of Zelda games. Hack and slash, little item power-ups, potions, and charged up attacks. You'll also control other characters at times, and they all play very much alike, except they will have contrasting statistics and different weapons. But all of that is only one aspect of Seema the Enemy. The real innovation this game brings is within the Pioneer system. As I mentioned, there are several characters with Ark. You're able to group them into parties of up to four members and give them basic orders, but you can also take advantage of their special attributes. For example, the children can cross weak bridges because of their lightweight, whereas the blacksmith can upgrade your weapons and armour. The list goes on and on. Now the adventure will likely last you around 10 to 15 hours, and unfortunately there's not that much in the way of replayability, which is a bit of a shame. There's no side quests, no big plot branches or decisions, so it does make for quite a linear experience. Instead of creating a generic hack and slash game, Natsume intelligently crafted one unlike any before it. The sad part though is that with the lack of knowledge about its release, Seema the enemy fell into obscurity and never got his chance to shine. Drone Racers has to be one of the best racing games on the Game Boy Advance, something you probably wouldn't expect from the LEGO license. Naturally, you'll find yourself participating in a championship mode, which serves as the main attraction. You get to choose from several racers and then take on the 18 tracks that make up the game. Sure, it doesn't sound like a lot of variety, but the actual gameplay more than makes up for what it lacks in variation. You see, just simply having to race to reach the finishing line is not the only aspect of the game you'll find yourself engaged in. Many power-ups such as rockets and boosters litter the track and offer up a way to gain the advantage on your opponents, and for each and every race you complete you earn points which can then be used on several aspects of your chosen vehicle. Stats like handling, speed and acceleration all contribute to your performance on the track, so deciding what to invest in early on can become vital to overcoming some of the more challenging races that you're presented later on. The AI is not cheap and will try anything to win, and it's this unexpected but welcome difficulty that helps drone racers live well past its perceived lack of content. But if there was only one thing I could say about the game, it would have to be the visuals that look almost impossible on the handheld, with each and every environment presenting a surprising amount of detail for the hardware it's running on. This attention to detail carries over to the vehicles themselves. It's clear they paid a lot of attention to the presentation of the game, as even with up to 10 other cars on the screen, you'll never run into a moment of slowdown. Overall, Drone Racers is in a league of its own and is well worth spending your time playing. With the huge popularity of the Pokemon series on the GBA, many copycats started to spring up and offer their own take on the timeless classic. What at first seems like a mere Pokemon clone soon shows itself to be an intriguing mix of adventure, combat and customization. You once again take on the adventure as Cody, and after the events of the first game, he sets off for new lands and challenges. Now gameplay will see you traversing a number of diverse locations and interacting with various NPCs that all add a real weight to the world through their actions and dialogue, but one of the main attractions of the game is no doubt the battle system, which is quite simple in its execution. It's turn-based in nature and offers up a ton of options when it comes to dispatching your enemies. The sequel improved on this aspect by introducing 4 on 4 battles, which ramps up the difficulty quite nicely. But the biggest aspect to robe upon is the fun in making your own monsters. There's 185 in total, and trying to make them all is a bit of a tall order. Scattered around the world 
the various batteries that form the basis of these monsters' creation, and by sparking them together, you generate a new robot. It doesn't stop there though, as each machine can be fully customized as well to allow for an assortment of weaponry and software that can help you gain the upper hand in battle. If you're looking for a decent Pokemon clone to jump into, Robopon 2 is a great choice. The Game Boy Advance was well known for several action RPGs that helped define it as one of the best handhelds of all time. One that sadly didn't get as much attention as it deserved though was Shining Soul 2. The gameplay is similar to that of other hack and slash games, and if you've ever played PSO, Diablo, Baldur's Gate, or any others of the type, you'll have a good idea of how things work. There are 8 classes to choose from, and each has its own pros and cons. For example, the Archer is great at long range attacks, but lacks in defense and short range abilities. Once you've got your character selected, you begin the madness. Now the game is split up into a series of levels that consist of various areas within. As you would expect, there's an assortment of imaginative enemies that occupy these spaces that need to be dealt with. The combat system is somewhat similar to Zelda, in the sense that you have a button for your main weapon, and another button for items. You walk or run around tapping A to attack, and gain experience, and when you get enough, you level up. And it's here where a lot of the fun lies, as you can choose which aspects of your character to increase, with a noticeable effect in battle. Of course, it's not just about slaying everything that moves, as along the way you'll gather a collection of loot, which can then be sold once returning to your hometown. This is one of the main ways to acquire some of the better gear that the game offers, but you'll also come across blacksmiths and banks that can help the player forge new weapons and amass a fortune to spend on rare items. If I could sum it up in one word, Shining Soul 2 is addictive. The gameplay loop it creates will keep you glued to your screen for hours on end. Well that does it for today's video. Don't forget to subscribe and hit that bell to get notified about new uploads. You can follow me on all of the socials to stay up to date and also join the growing community on Discord to meet many like-minded gamers to continue the conversation with. I'd like to give a special shout out to our Patreon supporters Rhino, Skill Gym, Nano, Steve, Richard, Amy, Daniel, Paul, David, Dio, Alex, Pierre, Carl, Strider and Paddy J for their continued support that helps make these videos possible. If you're interested in joining my Discord or supporting the channel through Patreon, for as little as $1 per month, you'll find the links in the description. As always, thanks for taking the time to watch the video, I'll catch you next time.